good news of the kingdom and healed every sickness among the people, according to Matthew 4, verse 23. Please join in the responsive call to worship as found in your morning bulletin. Christ is our light, our way in the dark. Come to the light of Christ. Christ calls us here to worship and to pray. Come and answer Christ's call. Christ leads us forth to teach and to heal. Come and worship our God. Light of the world, shine upon us this day. Break through the clouds that separate us from one another, that we may worship you as one body. Guide our steps that we may walk in your light and live as your people of love. Please join in our opening hymn number 545, The Church is One Foundation. <laughs>
Thank you. You may be seated. It's good to see everyone who is here with us today in person and all of those who gathered with us online. And please will invite those who are online uh, as we worship together here at Fletcher's Chapel and the Methodist Church to, uh, to comment or let us know in some other way that you are with us online today. And uh, if you are visiting with us, we always invite you to give us your contact information. Uh, if you're here, you can do so with our uh, pew cards that are located in our pew racks, and they can be put in our, our offering plates. In your bulletin are several opportunities for discipleship and uh, for participation. There are places where you can volunteer. There are a couple of opportunities listed for uh, how you can be involved in some training uh, to better serve out in the community or within our local churches. And so I invite you to take a uh, time to look at those. One of them is the Lay Servant Academy training that will be held in February, and that information is in your bulletin with multiple courses offered. And then there's our Mission Rivers Celebration Launch and District Training which will be um, offered on um, January 28th, Saturday the 28th, from 8 a.m. till 4 p.m. And in little tiny type in white, you'll see the list of courses, but you can also go to the web address there and get more information on that. Also, uh, in last week's bulletin, and uh, some more copies are at the back of the sanctuary, you'll find a, uh, just a guide to help you if you'd like to suggest some hymns uh, that we can be singing in the next four or five months. There's uh, some guides on there because we are entering into the season of Lent in February and then um, into Easter season in April. So I, I did put down some page numbers which are the hymns that are generally uh, deal with those seasons from our hymnal and I'd like you to write down a few of your favorite hymns on that sheet and either put them in the basket at the back, put them in the offering plate or give them uh, to me and you could actually just send me an email or a text with that information as well and we will try to work as many of those into our worship services over the next uh, uh, five or six months as we possibly can. Are there other announcements we need to be sure to lift up this morning? Yes, Tina. Um, they'll be in the bulletin next week, but on February the 4th, the United Methodist Women are going to be meeting at Four Seasons for lunch, and all is welcome. February 4th. At 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock? Yes. 11 a.m. at the Four Seasons, the United Methodist Women will be meeting, and all are welcome. Thank you. Any others? I have a thank you card to write. Dear Fletcher's Chapel family, thank you for the Christmas gift. I appreciate it so much and enjoyed using it on my trip. I miss seeing you last Sunday. Love always, Liz. Thank you, Liz. And thank you for your continued service. Will and Michaela, can I ask you to come up here for a minute? It has come to my attention that we officially listed y'all in the bulletin as our acolytes on January 2nd of 2021. And so as a thank you for your year of service and a few extra weeks, because <laughs> <laughs> I know you did a few things before that date, uh, we wanted to thank you for your service. And so we have a pen, an acolyte pen, United Methodist acolyte pen, that they can wear on their lapel that they would like to or on their blouse. And also we have a little uh, thank you card and we wanted to present those to you and thank you for accolading for us, especially during this last year. Would you like to welcome and thank them? that I've been here, they've been very dedicated and have missed very few Sundays. And it is always a joy to have them participating in the worship service. Thank you. Will you please join me in prayer? Lord, 
Open our hearts and our minds that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you are saying to us today. Amen. Amen. Today our Psalter reading is from Psalm 27, and we're reading verses 1, and then we're going to drop down to verse 4 and read through verse 9. It's found in your hymnal on page 758 and 759. <clears throat> and where we see the strange colored R, we will read the response that is printed above. Will you please join me with that? For with you is the fountain. Oh, it's good. Please stand. Yes. <laughs> I sometimes forget those things. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see the light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. But whom shall I be afraid? In verse 4, One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in the Lord's temple. For with you is the fountain of life, and your right do be seen light. The Lord will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble, will conceal me under the cover of his tent, and will set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above the land of the and I will offer sacrifices in the Lord's tent with shouts of joy. I will sing and make the Lord. For with you is the fountain of light, in your light do we see light. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, when my heart said, seek the Lord's face, your face, O Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me, turn not your servant away in anger, for you have been my help. As you are the Father, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother should forsake me, the Lord will take me up. For with you is the fountain of life, and your life to be seen. Thank you. You may be seated. And this morning, Danielle is going to lead us in our Old Testament and our New Testament reading. before you as they at, as with joy at the harvest as people exalt with dividing plunder for the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders the rod of their oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian and for the epistle lesson 1 Corinthians 1 10 through 18 now I appeal to you brothers and sisters by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you be in agreement, and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be knit together in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been made clear to me by Chloe's people that there are some quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, and I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you and except Crispus or Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of the Stephanas. <clears throat> Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else for Christ did not send me to baptize but to proclaim the gospel. 
and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ may not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Liz and I picked this next hymn a couple of weeks ago, but um, on the, the list that I've already started receiving of favorite hymns, this one was listed. So I'm glad that it was on the list of ones that are one of somebody's favorite. Please join in standing and singing number 277, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Him. 
As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, son, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat, and their father followed them. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to Jesus Christ. Christ. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O our Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. A clergy colleague of mine writes that he is a collector of lists. And so this morning, uh, one of his lists, one of the ones that he lists as his favorite, was something that, that spoke to me and, and for this sermon, so I want to share that list with you today. <coughs> It's a list of answers that were given by English school children on their religion exams. Noah's wife was called Joan of the Ark. <laughs> a myth is a female moth. Sometimes it is difficult to hear in church because the agnostics are so terrible. <laughs> the Pope lives in a vacuum. <laughs> The fifth commandment is humor your mother and father. Amen. And this is one of my favorites. Lot's wife was a pillar of salt by day and a ball of fire by night. <laughs> the point is, right answers are important, but you have to have thought about some of the right questions. The right questions, that's what we have to think about especially in the church. Are we asking the right questions? How long has it been since you had a powerful moment that changed your life forever? This morning, as we read the story of Jesus and his first disciples, Simon, Peter, Andrew, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, they were fishermen, and they had a powerful moment and they had to ask themselves the right question. They were called to follow. And amazingly, according to the scriptures, they did so immediately. There was no hesitation recorded. It said first they were called and immediately they followed. It does not say anything about them bringing in their nets. It does not say anything about them saying anything to anybody else on the shore saying, hey, keep an eye on our nets, or would you take these back home to dad for us, or anything. It says they immediately followed. And second, they left their professions. It was very likely a lucrative business of fishing to walk after Jesus, for fish was a mainstay of their diets. It was something that a lot of people in this area would have eaten for protein almost every single day. And their response is radical due to the fact that they also leave their families. There's nowhere in the scriptures that said that they had wives or girlfriends or children that followed them. It says that they got up and they left their families and they followed Jesus for the next three years left everything behind. How many of you would have done that, do you think? How many of you could walk away from your home today and not look back? It's something that it's really hard for us to comprehend, for it is truly a miracle. The miracle of Jesus' powerful word that creates following, that makes disciples. And it is the beginning of the Messianic community, the call of the first disciples. It's the beginning of the church as we know it. Just as Yahweh uprooted the prophets like Elisha and Elijah and others from their ordinary existence, so also Jesus represents the divine initiative in calling persons to discipleship. 
And all of us have at one time or another, in some way, answered Jesus' call in our life. Thankfully, we have not been called to leave our jobs and our homes and go on a moment's notice. But we have answered Jesus' call to discipleship or we would not be here gathered today. But notice that the emphasis is not on Jesus doing the calling, but on the response of the men in our scripture this morning. As we read the, the different Gospels, the four Gospels, as we try to line the stories up, there are slightly different versions of who and how and when Jesus called the first disciples. But what remains across the Gospels is their response, that they immediately got up and followed. They left their families and their work behind, and they followed Jesus. Now, in our, our passage from 1 Corinthians, we have another who refers to himself as a later apostle, Paul, who was not called to baptize, according to the scripture. He said he did not go around baptizing people, in specifically because he did not want to set up a hierarchy of baptism. He was called to travel, even though it was long after Jesus' death, and he was called to write, to write letters to various individuals and churches as they tried to grow as disciples and grow into the church and beyond. They, he was called on to settle disputes. He was called on to bring people together. He was called on to help interpret the Gospels. He was called on to help them to figure out the order for how they met as a church and how to recognize the various gifts of the Spirit that different people had in the church and make them work together. He often was called to listen to the different sides, to validate individuals' concerns, and then to provide a perspective on the issue and the problem so that all could be respected and that they could solve their own problems themselves, finding a resolution within their group as they were able to hear each other's perspective more clearly. And he was very ahead of his time in thinking that the women, the widows, the children, the orphans should all be treated well and should all have a voice in the church. That they all could and would be disciples of Jesus Christ. He passed along for us a codicil of of theology that is above all others for his made it into our holy bibles he was was one who who knew how to to read and to hear and to experience and he had lived during the days of jesus according to the scriptures and so he had had been hearing the stories for quite a while and he was able to say okay from my study of the Old Testament, what we now call the Old Testament, of the Torah and the prophets, and what I've been hearing Jesus say in the stories of Jesus, this is how I now understand God and how I understand Jesus' role as God's son. And one of the things that he reminds us is that Jesus was incarnated he was made human specifically to serve humans, to serve God and to serve humans, to serve God first, but by taking care of the least among us, to hear different perspectives and the voices of the people who often got lost, to make sure that people were healed and fed, and in doing so, he served God. By coming to take away the sins of the world, he was serving God. The Dominican theologian Herbert McCabe 
was speaking on the meaning of the Incarnation, and in that he, he wrote, we do not simply examine Jesus historically to see what he had, was like. We listen to Jesus. He established communication and friendship with us, and it is in this rapport with Jesus that we explore a different dimension of his existence. It is in the contact with the person who is Jesus, in this personal communication between who he is and who we are, that his divinity is revealed in his humanity. And so we get to see Jesus as a person, as a human, even as that illuminates who Jesus is as the divine. And one of the things that we see and hear is how good Jesus is at really listening to them and their needs. And that's a lot of what a pastor does today, is we're, we're called to listen. We're called to listen to people inside the church and outside the church. To really listen, not necessarily fix things, but to hear different perspectives. <coughs> to hear people's concerns and their needs, and then to offer love and care and acceptance. To listen to even the lowest on the social hierarchy and let them have a voice to be heard, to be recognized as a valued human being. And unfortunately, in our society today, that has become a real problem. We oftentimes cannot and will not hear the voices that most need to be heard. Sometimes because of the social hierarchy. And sometimes it's just such a different perspective than ours that we can't stop to listen to see where someone else is coming from. But Jesus came to serve, to care for people first, to teach second, and to preach so that folks would follow. And he helped people listen and listen to each other. So our call, the call of Jesus in this lecture, is not to a future salvation, but to be followers of Christ now, here, today, contemporary action, to fish for human beings in whatever lake or river we find ourselves, to joyfully serve God. And one of the wonderful things is that it can be a short-term call or a long-time call. We are to follow because that is what Jesus called us to do. And so some people find that they are called to an instant of action every now and then, to do something right now, right here, wherever I am, to serve someone. And other people get called into to being long-term missionaries and pastors and, and such, or school teachers, and Sunday school teachers to serve as doctors and nurses and in many other ways in order to serve God, to act as Christ in this world. And some people are called to short-term missionary work and to do something for a season and then move on to doing something else in Christ's name. According to John Purdy, Christianity, Christianity began as a working man's religion. Now, that's not the gospel according to, to Mark. It's the gospel according to Matthew. Matthew tells us that immediately after Jesus began his public preaching ministry, he took four fishermen as his apprentices. He was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He spied Andrew and Peter, casting their nets. He called them to follow him, promising to make them fishers of men. In Matthew's gospel then, Linked tightly together are Jesus' ringing pronouncement, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And his invitation to those fishermen was come and follow. You and I, who believe in Jesus Christ and count ourselves as his disciples, are not to follow a trade or profession as though it were the Holy Grail. We are to follow Jesus first. Work is to take on a secondary role in our lives. If Christ is truly our master, then work cannot be equally important. We may be engaged in work, but never married to it. 
And whenever we are pressed or tempted to make work supreme, we are called to recall the story of the four fishermen. We are to remember how they left their nets and their boat and they go to be with Jesus, to do what he would have them do. Samuel Candler follows that up with, follow me and I will make you fisher, said Jesus. Fishing takes practice, preparation, discipline. One must learn the best way to throw the net, how to make the mouth of the net open too so that it can actually catch the fish. And he writes, I can possibly throw the actual net, cast net a long way, but I can't always make that net open up so that it will actually form a circle around the fish. One must learn how to cast the line on a rod. Again, some folks can cast a long way, but their accuracy is so awful. There may be fish on the right, but they only know how to cast the line to the left. There may be fish on the left, but they keep casting to the right. Casting like discipleship is an acquired habit. It requires practice. Fishing is noticing what the weather's like, watching the wind and the clouds. Fishing like the gospel, dear friends, like the gospel. Fishing is always practiced in context. It does no good to sit at one lake and wish I had was on some other lake. It does no good to stand at the ocean and wish the weather was different. On that day in that place, I fish in context according to what the conditions are. So it is with the proclamation and the living out of the Christian gospel. It does a little good wishing that we were somewhere else in a different time or a different country perhaps. Our contact is, text is this time and this place. Know where the wind blows. Watch the clouds. As a little girl, I had a church member who took me out fishing for the first time. And he was teaching me how to cast the rod and how to fish in the sound off, the, uh, off an island. And the water was kind of choppy that, that day. And so he pulled the line back in, and to my heart, he cut the line. Took all the, the hooks and the weights and everything off. But then he began tying on new hooks and new weight, and we switched to a different kind of bait. And he was telling me that what we had was so lightweight, it was just floating on the surface above the fish. We needed to get deeper down. And because the water was so choppy, it was just knocking the bait right on off of the hooks. We needed a bait that would stay on uh, despite the movement of the waves. And sure enough, a few minutes later, we caught my first fish. Just a pinfish. Wasn't even big enough to, to make a, a fish cake out of. But we caught my first fish. And I learned an important lesson that day. Now, Mr. Hardy, he taught one of the Sunday school classes there at church. And he did a number of other things around the church. He was known for his generosity. And I remember back on those days, 50 plus years ago, to what I remember him teaching me, not just about that line in the water. I had many more fishing trips with him over the years, but I also remember how he taught to fish for people in whatever body we were in. There was a church member that got caught up in a, a scheme and was um, the last, last up standing, you might say. And he ended up having to go to, to jail for a while for uh, fixing uh, uh, bids with the state of Virginia for highway maintenance and uh, asphalt. And he ended up spending two years in jail. And Henry Hardy reminded him to go fish in the pond he was finding himself in. And this gentleman started a Bible study in his jail cell with the other inmates. And even after he got out of jail for the rest of his life, every week, he went back to that jail and he had Bible study with the inmates. And it, it was amazing to hear the stories of how many people not only wanted to come to his Bible study, 
but to hear the sheriff's department talk about the decrease number of those individuals who got out, who they had to rearrest. Several people talked about going straight after hearing his Bible studies, of learning what it meant to follow Jesus. Someone has said that there's a huge difference between having a job at church and having a ministry at church. Henry Hardy had a ministry. If you are doing it because no one else will, it's a job. If you're doing it to serve the Lord, it's a ministry. If you're doing it just well enough to get by, it's a job. If you're doing it to the best of your ability, it's a ministry. If you'll do it only so long as it doesn't interfere with other activities, it's a job. If you're committed to staying with it, even when it means letting go of other things, it's a ministry. It's hard to get excited about a job. It's almost impossible not to get excited about a ministry. An average church is filled with people doing jobs. A great church is filled with people involved in ministry. Jesus continues to call people to be fishers of other people. Jesus calls some of us to the adventure of serving in the mission field in a foreign land. Others are called to the adventure closer to home, serving God's people through service organizations and schools, through food service and legal assistance, through volunteering and voting, through offering prayers and healing. There are so many ways for God's people to follow Jesus into the adventure of serving. And the good news is that Jesus came to bring salvation to all of us. No matter who people are, no matter where they live, no matter what kind of life they have led, he came especially for those who struggle in this world, for minorities and women and children, for those who have known trouble and are paying their debt to society in prison, for those who find themselves struggling to make it through the day because of sickness or addiction or depression or or disability or mental illness. We have been called by Jesus to come and serve. How do we know? Because we are here. We're listening to God's word today. The question is, how do we respond? Is it just a job for us? Or with radical obedience as we engage together in ministry? The key point to this morning's gospel was not that Jesus called his disciples, but how they followed immediately, completely, and radically. And it raises the question for us. How do we respond? Are we responding this week? Is God calling us to do something different this week? To something new? Are we listening as we go about our daily activities to hear if God is calling us in a particular moment for a particular action? What one thing will we try to do this week in ministry with Jesus? For Jesus came to call us. And then to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. Amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning is found on page 884 in the back of your hymnal. Today we are using a statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit and join as we say the, the statement of faith in unison. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in a grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as a sufficient rule over the faith and their practice. 
that you would like to share this morning. Yes, John. Uh, my son really needs this job in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. He's put in the work. He's credentialed. I just hope that he gets it. So your, job, uh, your son really needs the job for which he has applied. For which he's qualified. <laughs> and for which he's qualified. He's done the work. And Tennessee's not too far away. And Tennessee's <laughs> not too far away. At least they decided. Yes, Jean. Um, we got news last week that our sister-in-law is now in remission from stage four cancer. Wonderful. Sister-in-law is in remission. She still needs prayers, but that's another subject. <laughs> yes. yes. Yes, a dear friend of mine that I've known for since I was about 14 years old is, um, in, is in her last stages of life, and we'd like to pray. Lord, take her peace for Dawn, what's her name? Dawn Hayner, H. Dawn is in need of prayer as, as she transfers from this life to the next. Exactly. And also, I have a joy. Oh. Okay, good. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> Um, prayers for um, the family and friends of um, Jerry Hacker. Jerry he passed. Mackett. He passed away unexpectedly this past week. Jerry Hacker's family. Jerry Hacker. Hacker. Excuse yes. me. After his death this week. Yes, Debbie. was, um, uh, I knew it took a long time for the road to be opened back up. There was a bad accident out here just past the Dollar General, um, apparently, and um, it, 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 you said that there was a fatality. And I know that there were lots of ambulances and a couple of fire trucks that were called out. I think there was like five ambulances that were passed across the Yes, Kim. Carlton. Carlton, he's in the hospital right now with uh, appendicitis. And what's the name? Carlton. Carlton. Yeah. In the hospital with appendicitis. Yes, Debbie. I have a joy. I think it's awesome that we're all here together it's to see everybody. It's nice to see the pews full. <laughs> yes, it is. It is a fuller looking sanctuary today than it has been. Yes. I think I counted 38 or 39. 37 is what you have. And you got 40. <laughs> I got 40. I've got multiple personalities. John has multiple personalities. <laughs> okay, at least it's not 40.1. <laughs> yeah, thankfully it's not 40.1, yes. And I wanted to ask for prayers for Hilda, family friend. Hilda? In her last days. Also in her last days. Um, joy that I got home okay. And joy that you got home okay, yes. And uh, we also want to lift up Fred and Sue. We're so glad that they are at church with us today, but continued our thoughts and prayers with you and the death of not only Sue's mother, but also some additional family, extended family and friends that died about the same time. So our sympathies and our condolences to you. Any others? I also would like to lift up a couple of, uh, of former uh, church members and colleagues of mine. Um, one is uh, the pianist at my last church uh, was diagnosed with, with breast cancer right after I moved here. And she was rushed to the hospital with pneumonia 
uh, this week instead of getting her cancer treatment. And she is having terrible times with breathing yesterday. Um, as of 10 o'clock last night, she was stable, but she's in need of prayers. Uh, her name is Alice. And then a friend of mine, um, he's a colleague who uh, I served with in Emporia um, just before um, you, one of your former pastors went um, to the same community. And um, Bert is, um, uh, has had four heart attacks in six months. Mm. And his last one was, was just a week ago. He's home right now, but he's my age. And uh, so a little too young to be having so many heart attacks. Um, but please keep him and his wife, um, who is also a pastor, in your prayers. Anyone else? Any other joys? And I want to add oh, um, special okay. prayers that Linda will be feeling better this coming week. Prayers that will be Linda will be feeling better, yes. Anyone else? Thank y'all for helping me when I miss people occasionally. If not, let's begin our time of prayer together with a moment of silent meditation. I'll lead us in prayer and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. O oh God, whose throne is built on the foundation of righteousness and justice, we give you thanks this day. We thank you that we don't have all the answers, but have simply come to worship you. For in you all things are revealed. We thank you that faith is not measured by the ardor of belief, but by a humble and contrite heart. We give you thanks this day for the eternal truths of faith that has been handed down to us that you are a God who has covenanted again and again and again with a hard-hearted people, who has delivered again and again a straying people, who has provided again and again for an ungrateful people, that you are a God whose steadfast love endures forever. We thank you that you so love the world that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, we pray this day that we might come to understand how his life and death gained for us life abundant and eternal. Help us to believe that we can be set free, finally and fully free, in the loving truth of Jesus Christ our Lord. You taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we think of discipleship, it comes in many different forms, as I talked about a little bit earlier. It can be writing thank you notes to people who need to hear a kind word. It can be in just how you greet someone who's having a bad day and you show them love and consideration and kindness even if they're biting your head off. It can be in the ways in which you serve the people in the community around you or even how you work with your coworkers. It also comes in forms like when you come up front and act polite. It's a bigger job than it sounds, making sure that the candles are lit safely and extinguished. Of being here to open the doors or make sure the heat is on and the lights are on, to welcome the first arrivers. It comes in forms, big and small. It also comes in how we make sure that the bills get paid and we make sure that the lights can be turned on. 
I had one church that didn't have enough money to pay the fuel bill one year. So they decided not to meet in the sanctuary because the fellowship hall tank still had some oil in it. And none of them wanted to give money. Didn't, wasn't that they couldn't. It's that none of them wanted to give money to fill up the sanctuary heating tank. That church no longer exists. Discipleship comes in many forms. And sometimes it just means making sure others have the resources they need to be in ministry in Jesus' name. United in mind and purpose, let us share in the ministry of generous giving this day. Will our ushers please come?
Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.